Now for today's program. Ken Burns has been making documentary films for over 40 years. Since the Academy Award nominated Brooklyn Bridge in 1981, Ken has gone on to direct and produce some of the most acclaimed historical documentaries ever made, including The Civil War, Baseball, and Jazz, among many others. His most recent documentary is The U.S. and the Holocaust. Future film projects include The American Buffalo, Leonardo da Vinci, The American Revolution, Emancipation to Exodus, and LBJ and the Great Society. Ken's films have been honored with dozens of major awards, including 16 Emmy Awards, two Grammy Awards, and two Oscar nominations. And in September of 2008, at the News and Documentary Emmy Awards, Ken was honored by the Academy of Television Arts and Sciences with a Lifetime Achievement Award. His just-released book is Our America, A Photographic History. Joining Ken today is Michael Krasny. Michael served as host of the award-winning forum program at KQED, the San Francisco National Public Radio affiliate, where he interviewed many of the world's leading political, cultural, literary, and science and technology figures. Michael is an emeritus professor of English at San Francisco State University and teaches a course on short fiction masterpieces at Stanford University. Michael will be teaching a four-week course on great Jewish short stories for Moment this coming January. He is currently the host of the podcast Gray Matter with Michael Krasny. Michael is the recipient of many awards and honors, including Career Achievement Award from the Society of Professional Journalists and received an award from the Radio and Television News Directors Association. A veteran interviewer for the nationally broadcast City Arts and Lectures, Michael is working on two books, one on the art of the interview and the other on race. Michael is the author of Let There Be Laughter, a treasury of great Jewish humor and what it all means. Please welcome Ken Burns and Michael Krasny. And thank you all for being here for this, what I hope will be not only an important, but certainly an educational interview with Ken Burns, who I'm always delighted to be in conversation with. In fact, let me, before we even begin, congratulate Ken on the U.S. and the Holocaust film, which is a remarkable achievement and an extraordinarily important film, but also on the book, Our America, which we'll talk about to some degree. Mainly, we're gonna talk about the US and the Holocaust film, which I hope most of you who are joining us have seen at least part of the three part series. Um, it is, as I said, and can't reiterate enough, I think a very important film, particularly in light of what we're seeing as a recurrence of unfortunately all this toxic antisemitism. But Ken, welcome, always pleased to be with you. Oh, Michael, always great to be with you. Thanks for having me and I look forward to our conversation. And thanks to Moment Magazine for having us. Uh, I want to talk to you, of course, about the film and, as I said, about our America. But maybe we'd start back when this film uh, was being imagined or being set forth with you and Sarah Botstein and Lynn Novick, the team. Um, it was 2015, and you had no idea, I believe, that history would be rhyming. Now, when I say that, I invoke Mark Twain, but I also can't help thinking of Biden, who quoted Thomas Heaney about the hope that history will rhyme with hope. But the idea of history rhyming became sort of central in many ways as the work on the film progressed, didn't it? Yeah, we were thinking about this for years and years before that, just thinking about it after our World War II film, which you and I have talked about that came out in 2007, a lot of people approached us. We had a fairly significant scene on the Holocaust with a lot of misinformation and disinformation and particular questions that were trying to make uh, FDR the villain of the piece. Um, uh, things about the St. Louis, the ship that was turned away from Havana, Cuba into something that it wasn't quite. And, and so we were sort of realizing there was another story to tell. Same thing happened when we did our series Seven years later on the Roosevelts, Lynn and Sarah uh, were not involved in that, but Jeff Ward was the common writer between all three of the projects. And we were thinking about it when we were approached by the Holocaust Museum, as you point out, in a very different time. They were contemplating an exhibition called Americans, plural, and the Holocaust. And would we think about wanting to do a film? We said, yes, of course, not of their exhibition, but to work in tandem and cooperation and association and, and, and help help each other uh, do what they were, we were doing. And of course, we always know, no matter what film we're working on, whether it's Brooklyn Bridge or The Shakers, that it is going to, as Twain possibly said, rhyme. But we had no idea as the developing momentum of the series and the world that we're living in, 
um, really conspired to to set off every alarm bell I've ever had as a filmmaker. Um, we usually take as much time as we can to make a film, and we did in this case, and it's not there's no short shrift, but about a year and a half ago, I told Sarah and Lynn, much to their consultation, that we had to bring it out a year early. We were planning to bring it out next year, Michael, um, but I just felt that too many things were going on, the rise in anti-Semitism, the way in which so many of the things that we use to set up the series about American racism and, and a treatment of indigenous people, uh, xenophobia and nativism, and particularly anti-Semitism were you know, so spectacularly important that we had to actually have a different kind of ending that we imagined. We weren't going to end in 1965 when Johnson changes the pernicious Johnson Reed Immigration Act into something that eliminates the quotas. We had to sort of bring it up, at least impressionistically, in the last couple of minutes to the present moment and did um, because of the sense of urgency about it. So, yeah, I, I mean, I'm sorry to report that. I know that anytime we touch a subject in American history, it will rhyme in the present, but it, this one is uncomfortably so. Plus, you couldn't escape, as time went on, all the parallels to refugees and migrants being kept out of the United States and all of this, notwithstanding the fact that you stood firmly, I know, with, um, I think, a tenacity uh, that I admire behind the idea that uh, the story should tell by themselves that you call right. balls and strikes and you don't want to be a polemicist. But there was a, a certain intent here with a reckoning about the United States, this exceptional country that we believe it to be with good reason. With good and reason. that the United States ought to be seen perhaps in terms of its history in some darker colors and, and more views of, uh, shall we say, consternation and, and things that would trouble us deeply. It, and that's exactly right. And you put it so eloquently. I think that, you know, Americans have 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 hid in so many times and, and periods behind that sense of exceptionalism that here we were inventing for the first time the notion that people could govern themselves, that all men were created equal, that we are a nation of immigrants. But, you know, our history doesn't always uh, prove that. And in the case of this story, uh, we see it as we had no idea, separated by an ocean and a continent about what was going on. We then ended fascism and liberated Europe and came across to our shock, shock, shock and horror, the concentration camps. And that's when we learned about it. It's just not true, I'm sorry to say. We knew there were 3,000 newspaper articles in 1933 alone. That's the year that Hitler came to power about discrimination against the Jews. And it only got worse. We knew what was going on. We knew what was happening. And um, we had a hard time doing something about it. And it's not just um, what's going on in Europe. It's also that we and, and our pernicious immigration laws that, you know, many good people were trying to push against. It's some of the most famous people in America were out and out anti-Semitic. Henry Ford, you know, bought a newspaper, the Dearborn Independent, and published, uh, republished the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, the most anti-Semitic track, a Russian hoax from the 19th century. It had the second highest circulation uh, of a newspaper in America. He thought Jews were responsible for the murder of Abraham Lincoln. Charles Lindbergh, the celebrated aviator, became the spokesman of the America First, the largest anti anti-war movement in the United States, but also virulently anti-Semitic. And a lot of people from the beginning of the 20th century onward were subscribers, and the Johnson Reed Immigration Act reflected this of a pseudoscience with absolutely no basis in fact, that saw a hierarchy of races, of ethnicities, of nationalities, that put at the top of that hierarchy um, the Nordic, uh, white, Protestant, Hitler would say and did say Aryan people, and who were given you know, expansive quotas to come into the United States because Americans, white Protestant Americans, were fearful that they were being replaced, which is something is echoing today, by the wave of immigrants, mostly from Southern and Central Europe, mostly Catholics and Jews who had come in by the millions between 1870 and 1920 when we had mostly open borders and and they believed everyone else inferior and so we're you know we we were in a country that was not disposed to let in anybody and certainly not disposed to let in refugees and certainly not jewish refugees and that's something that as you said we actually have to reckon with and the story of the u.s and the holocaust you know, time out, the United States has nothing to do with the Holocaust. But unlike those desperate human pe human beings that required a piece of paper, a visa or a passport to get out 
of danger out of harm's way, the ideas needed no such um, uh, passport. And so they flowed freely between countries. Um, the, the, the insanity of eugenics and, and the evil of anti-Semitism and bigotry and racism and, and the extermination and, and isolation of native peoples in this country, uh, all of that is, is flowing. Hitler admired what we'd done the extermination of the, the, the Indians and the conquering of the Wild West was what he wanted to do in the Wild East. He didn't see the Slavic people as real people, um, like we didn't see the native people as real people. And so- Well, all the Slavic people would be slaves, essentially. Essentially, they would be slaves. basically he was gonna give them the breathing room, the Liebenstraum yeah. that, the, that the German people were entitled to. It wasn't enough to take back the Rhineland or to, 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 to sort of annex Austria and the Sudetenland and then Czechoslovakia. We wanted everything East, you know, he wanted everything East. When you outline as you bring across really so fastidiously and so with such excellence in the film, the reasons that we need to have this reckoning, our own heritage, if you will, of anti-Semitism, of racism, of nativism, I mean, uh, the eugenics that was particularly important at the time, and I think maybe having a comeback to some degree. Also, I keep thinking also, uh, notwithstanding how important all of those things are, the indifference. Um, and we get into some sort of mood areas where Roosevelt is concerned because there are those, especially I don't want to mention a, a main rival of Moment Magazine, but Tablet is another Jewish magazine and they've been going through a lot of revisionism about Roosevelt's role. And you've tried to present a more nuanced view of Roosevelt. Yeah. He had a lot of political considerations and there was a lot of isolationism. It was complicated. But at the same time, there are those who say he could have done more, he should have done more. He was indifferent. Yeah, I... I understand that. And I think the magnitude of the Holocaust, what we understand now, however much it gets abstracted, six million means nothing now. Um, you have to find new ways to, to, to talk about the horror of it. And as the writer Daniel Mendelssohn says in the film, particularize it. But I think that you needed to find somebody to blame and uh, somebody of kind of equal stature with the crime. Um, it's why we often have conspiracies about you know, famous Americans who've been assassinated because the person who did it couldn't possibly be at the same level. So we have to have many more people. In this case, Franklin Roosevelt has been unfortunately, and we've done, we've delved deep for years and years into the scholarship on this. He wasn't a king, he wasn't a fearer. He couldn't have just snapped his fingers and said, okay, St. Louis, dock at Miami, we'll take your huddled masses, yearning to breathe free. He would have been impeached probably. He understood the nation he was in. And I think putting it on Roosevelt is another way of not putting it on ourselves. We've got a racist State Department, and sure, he could have fired everybody there had he understood that anti-Semitic State Department. Not everyone, but but many and, and important people, particularly the Undersecretary Breckinridge Long, who slow walked everything, changed the rules, raised the bar, moved the goalposts, whatever you want to say, that made it harder and harder. I mean, look. Excuse me, Ken, I think Breckinridge Long is a real villain in this is real sure. and and, yeah. and 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 deserves all the opprobrium we can heap on him, uh, but we 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 could have done much more, and Roosevelt could have done much more. And there are times when you're you're really uncomfortable about the kind of coldness or the political calculate calculation involved. But I think, as the historians say, and as you said, it's complicated, and you have to do this. That if he hadn't been able to get the neutrality acts revoked. <laughs> We might all be speaking German, so you know. Let's let's try to put it in a little bit of a, a perspective. But having said that, you know, we let in two hundred twenty-five thousand refugees. That's that is more than any other sovereign nation. But we could have let in, even with this horrible Johnson Reed Immigration Act of twenty-four, probably five times as many if people hadn't made it harder for those people who are trying to get in, like Anne Frank's father, to 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 get into this country, which means maybe we could have done 10. So you're talking about 2 million people all of a sudden, and that's a different calculus. That's a pretty important number of human beings that, that we might have been able to let in. And you bring into the film the attempt by Otto Frank and Frank's father to 
find passageway or entrance into America. And he was actually pretty well connected and still couldn't. That's the, that, I think that's the biggest thing that for most of the 1930s, this man who is well-to-do, he has connections in the United States. He's not going to be a ward of the state, which is the worry and the excuse that you're using. Let's remember, too, the depression is going on and that indifference you're talking about is born probably as much about my own self-interest. Am I going to lose my job as it is? Or will I ever have a job again? Will I be able to feed my family as it is a kind of, you know, day-to-day -day outright, you know, uh, vicious anti-Semitism? But that's there as well. But yeah, he's he's got every, he's the perfect candidate to come to the United States and he can't get in. And you mentioned the 6 million figure, which almost has become, one can't get one's head around that figure to begin with. It's almost become in some ways a senseless number. Uh, it's been, uh, we become anesthetized to the number because it's so, it represents such enormity. Um, and yet there could have been a million Jews let into this country. And there could have been just, as you point out in the film, with kinder transport, about 20,000 children left into this country, even though 200,000 were led in more than any other sovereign state. This was done in England. This was not done here. And there was real opposition to the fact that many, including Eleanor Roosevelt, thought it should have been done. Yeah, uh, Edith North Rogers, a, a congresswoman from Massachusetts, and Senator Wagner from New York State introduced a bill to br bring in 10,000 kids, not their parents, 10,000 kids in 39 and 40, 20,000. And, and they withdrew the bill. Uh, you know, Roosevelt privately coached the First Lady and others how to pass it, but the, the sentiment was such that they felt that if they'd actually brought it to the floor, it would not have been so watered down and destroyed that they would have actually been able to introduce legislation to stop all immigration, period, full stop. And, you know, and when you realize that, then you make that kind of calculus. And, and, and you know, one thing I didn't mention in, in the sort of FDR and us, the Congress is 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 anti-Semitic. State Department, the American people are anti-Semitic, and Roosevelt knows all of this and has to do that. But but we also just um, have this kind of sense that we know what's best for us, and uh, you know he has to calculate how far to go, when to put on the gas, when to do this. He does end up approving and pushing through when the State Department resists the single greatest thing we did to save other human beings besides win the war militarily, and that's the War Refugee Board. And we are familiar all with the story of Raul Wallenberg, but he's underwritten entirely by the United States. It was a Treasury Department project led by a young man named John Paley, who's one of the great heroes, uh, approved by Morgenthau, his boss, the Jew in, in, in Roosevelt's uh, cabinet, then stopped by the State Department for months and months and months. And then finally, Morgenthau and Roosevelt pushed it through. But they're saving people in, in Hungary and Romania, tens of thousands of people, and in southern France, using bribes and false papers and forgeries and enlisting the international community, including the Swiss and uh, uh, Swedish legations, of which, of course, Raoul Wallenberg is from. And so this is this is the story you need to tell. You need to tell the story of Varian Fry, a, a writer in New York, who didn't need to risk his life, strapped 3,000 bucks to his calf and went to Marseille and got out, you know, Max Ophels and Hannah Arendt and, and and, um, um, you know, Marc Chagall and Mouch uh, 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 Duchamp and, and, and so-called ordinary human beings just wanting to escape Nazi terror. It's a, it's a really fabulous story. And who was he aided by? Hiram Bingham Jr., the ultra high wasp, uh, you know, vice counsel in Marseille, uh, a, a member it's a of story. the State it's Department. It's story. Who's in, as Varian Fry says, in, in the crime of saving lives. And it was a crime because what they were doing was illegal. It's part of the, uh, the hope with people, figures like Hiram Bingham that comes across from the, the film. But, you know, you look into the flames, as Elie Wiesel said, and you can get burned from them. Uh, it's very difficult to look in and stare at them uh, in terms of the show. And I wonder, what would you like people particularly to learn from your film? You've always been not only a historian, but an educator. And your films are made to tell our stories and make us understand our stories. And this is a story, it's a very tragic story for the most part. It's a catastrophic story. You know, I'm, I'm interested in facts. I think we're all interested in facts. We're interested in the truth and supposedly a post-truth era. I'm first and foremost a filmmaker. And so I'm a storyteller. And I think, you know, as Richard Powers said, the novelist said, you know, the best arguments in the world won't change a single person's point of view. The only thing that can do that is a good story. 
and I've tried to be in the business of telling good stories and it's really up to the audience uh, to decide that. But I, th I think for me then, in answer to your question, I, I don't mean to dodge it at all. I just sort of think that the making of it over the years with the care and the attention and the, the times we locked it and then unlocked it 150 times to correct something or to be a little bit more conservative, to step off the gas, to just tell it right is in and of itself the work. And then once it's done, it's yours, it's the audience's. And that that change that Powers anticipates a story is able to do occurs majorly in the center or maybe at the edges and we just have to let it go. We just want people to understand as our, our, our editing room neon sign says, and you said earlier, it's complicated. That's what we have up there. And there's not a filmmaker on earth that doesn't know that when you have a good scene, you don't wanna to touch it. But I've spent my entire professional life touching and unlocking and maybe making less really great scenes because we learned contradictory uh, information about something. Your film makes palpable again, the horror of the Holocaust. I mean, in some ways it is a Holocaust film. And I wonder, you know, especially now that we have in the news very prominently, Nick Fuentes, a Holocaust denier, and we have Holocaust deniers all over social media. In fact, it's, it's really like a virus. Um, your film is not necessarily going to reach those people. And even if they saw it, they probably would discount it uh, as you're being a marionette or something along those lines. Um, do you ever wrestle with this whole question yeah. of? Yeah, I, I, you know, the, the, the biggest thing that I worry about is the kind of reverse of that, Michael, which is I don't want to be involved in the kind of, as, as you talked about, we've, we've been free of advocacy in our, our films, right? And so we want to speak to as many people as we possibly can, and we want to avoid preaching to the choir, right? We, we, we just, there's no value in preaching to the choir, which is, unfortunately, too often the case with many political advocacy films. The people are see, who see it are the people who already agree with it going in. And what I've enjoyed is a large audience that really spans that and, and, and therefore it makes us susceptible to criticisms as people on the left and the right perceive a certain attitude or bias, a certain conservatism if, if it's from the left or a certain liberalism if it's from the right, which is exactly the way it should be. But I, I, I do worry that, that, but at the same time, the impulse I don't know how you were feeling leading up to the midterms, but I just feel just like this much better, right? And I don't know whether our film had anything to do with it or not. It's ridiculous to even contemplate it. But we insisted, I insisted that it come out before that so it could be part of the conversation. And it seems that at least part of the reason why we feel just a little bit better is that we felt that that, for example, the, the election deniers, you know, running for secretary of state or lieutenant governor or election, you know, overseers, they were defeated. And, and that, that it suggested a kind of return to some normalcy and some sanity. It's certainly not enough. We're still fragile. And I think the film points out, and um, particularly Daniel Mendelssohn points out the fragility of the institutions. I mean, we went through our three great crises before this crisis, the Civil War, the Depression, and the Second World War, without worrying about free and fair elections, without worrying about peaceful transfer of power, without worrying about you know the independence of the judiciary, all of which we are worrying about right now and are a part and parcel of the same discussion we want to have about Nick Fuentes and why he was invited to dinner in Florida, you know, by a president, an ex-president of the United States. This is terrifying. I mean, Lindbergh is terrifying in his own right. Henry Ford is terrifying in his own right. But when you're giving oxygen at this high level to these incendiary and, and fraudulent ideas, this is, this is more than screaming fire in a crowded theater when there's no fire. Well, it prompts me also to ask you about something that really made the news when DeSantis, the governor of Florida, sent refugees from Venezuela up to Martha's Vineyard, and you came out and made an analogy to the Holocaust, political stunt you called it, I believe, which clearly it was, but it put you in the direct firing line of being accused yeah. of partisan politics. And it also, I suppose, um, makes... Um, Somebody like in the National Review say, uh, come on, Ken, uh, I think I'm, I'm paraphrasing. Uh, they're not going to Auschwitz or something like that. How can you use a Holocaust well, so parallel? This is, 
this is where this is how this uh, authoritarian machine works. I was on New Day, a morning show on CNN, uh, hosted that that day by John Berman, and Lynn and I were talking about the Holocaust. And once we'd finished talking, promoting, it was a Thursday morning, and the film was going to premiere on Sunday and and Monday and Tuesday. He then said, well, yeah, that's so interesting, and I feel like I have to ask you, did you hear about Governor DeSantis shipping immigrants to uh, Martha's Vineyard? And I said to him, I don't like the weaponization of other human beings. This is out of the authoritarian playbook, and it seems to be consistent with the way DeSantis acts. If the Disney country disagrees with him, he takes away a tax break. If his own state employee disagrees with him, he fires them. I said, those are the hallmarks of, of an authoritarian thing. Nothing to do with that. That day, within hours, on the Fox Online, it said, Ken Burns links DeSantis with the Holocaust, which I did not. And if you read the article, nowhere in the article does it say that. But of course, no one reads the articles who is looking to grab a pitchfork and a torch. And then it bounced across the pond to the Daily Mail, another Rupert Murdoch uh, mouthpiece, and then bounced back to the New York Post, all with the same headline and all with the same content. And if you read it, it I in no way linked DeSantis to that. But the attacks and the threats and the stuff to us and our and our, uh, you know, our colleagues were were real and palpable, and it just shows you how lies and misinformation have been used throughout history uh, to to bend what actually is being said. There's nothing that I said that in any way related um, him to the to the uh, Holocaust. We've been talking about authoritarianism in our country, and I segued to that from a description and a promotion of our film and specifically addressed what is very disturbing aspects. And I, he had yet to release that just terrifying commercial, which looks like God appointed DeSantis to be the, you know, the, the savior of Florida and, and by extension of the United States. So you know, uh, I was just calling a spade a spade at that point, but no way linking it, but it got linked and it was impossible to unlink until the feeble attention spans of those outraged uh, moved on to the latest outrage. Well, have there also been links to, for example, maybe uh, your film being interpreted along the lines of you want open borders and that's really what you're calling <laughs> for, something like that? No, I mean, there's nothing in the film that you can find that says that about open borders. It thought that, you know, there were millions of human beings that were trying to flee Nazi terror and that we had the opportunity to save a lot more than we did. And and I'd say not just a million, maybe two million. That puts a dent in the six million. Well, those, should we retire six million? Should we just stop? I, using I think, it? you know, it, it, it's so bad. Daniel Mendelssohn wrote a book called, you know, Six of the Six Million. You know, he went, he found out what happened to his great uncle Schmiel and his wife and four daughters in a tiny little provincial town in, in eastern Poland called Bolochov. Um, It's now in western Ukraine. Um, and, you know, only one of the six died in a gas chamber. So all of a sudden, the particularizing changes your sense of it. Another way to do it is to do the more simple mathematics that our film and the Holocaust Museum does. In 1933, there are 9 million Jews. In 1945, two out of three are dead. That's another way. And we show a picture of a footage of a lovely woman looking out a window, joined, we assume, by her parents, who kind of recede. And you just realize... Maybe she's the one, or maybe one of the other two are the one, but two of those three people are going to be gone. And that's a different way to do it. And the particularizing it, the letter, you know, thrown from a train or mailed to a friend that says, I, I just want the world to know that someone named Daniel Berger lived. Yeah, there's a wonderful poem by Dylan Thomas about, you know, how a child dying by fire as opposed to putting it in the abstract of thousands of children dying by fire can be much more arresting on the imagination and have much more of a firm hold on it. Um, but how did, we, I think people would be interested in hearing, how did you select, for example, Daniel Mendelssohn? And you have all of these scholars. I mean, it's obvious you, Deborah Lipstadt is very much in the news and now an advisor on anti-Semitism to President Biden. But you have a lot of historical scholars as well as the selection of actors and the selection of just so many illustrious people who play a certain role. So, you know, everyone from Meryl Streep to, uh, you know, all the way um, lesser known figures. But uh, so I think, is I there think a process? It, yeah, there is, but there's not a, a, a formula. 
And so a lot of this is serendipity. You know, our association with the Holocaust Museum brought us Rebecca Erbelding and Danny Green and other people that were not filmed at, uh, and Deborah Lipstadt. Of course, we would have arrived at even before her status as ambassador level uh, posting at the State Department uh, about anti-Semitism. Um, and so needed now. She is a remarkable and formidable uh, woman um, and just a delight to work with, funny and serious and, and passionate about her work and, and, and so smart. Uh, and then we also had some survivors, many of whom were, we were directed to by the Holocaust Museum. And then in the middle, I thought it was Daniel Mendelssohn. I mean, we had Timothy Snyder, we had Peter Hayes, all, all you know, really terrific scholars. And we had uh, survivors who really could personalize what we're just talking about. And then Daniel Mendelssohn, who does both um, by virtue of being an artist and by virtue of being a scholar and by virtue of being the great nephew of, of a set of uh, victims uh, of the Holocaust in Nazi-occupied Poland. So um, it's pretty well balanced. The voices are voices we use and have like to use. And, and we, I'd seen a film uh, called News of the World, a Western with Tom Hanks that was done by Paul Greengrass, which had a wonderful German gal um, uh, named uh, Zegler as her last name. And I just, we tracked her down and, and she read the voice of Anne Frank. And, um, you know, it's, it's sort of like they follow the leads or you have an inspiration. We made a film that came out in the spring on um, uh, Benjamin Franklin. And I had been a few years before that watching Homeland and looked at the character Saul Berenson, played by Manny Patinkin, and I go, that's my my Franklin. And, you know, I got him. We did it all in COVID remotely. I didn't meet him until we appeared on the Late Show with Stephen Colbert together and hugged and kissed each other like we'd known each other for, for decades. But he ended up thinking that that, uh, along with Princess Bride and Sunday in the Park with George were the three greatest things he's done. I mean, meaning personifying, reading off camera, uh, Benjamin Franklin. So a lot of this is just using your, your sort of gut about who you're drawn to, who, who could say this. And um, Meryl had already been the voice of, of Eleanor Roosevelt in our 2014 series, The Roosevelts. And so we just asked her to reprise uh, this remarkable woman, uh, Meryl Streep, and this remarkable person, Eleanor Roosevelt, who I sort of still think, and we probably talked about this, it's the only person I know who's right on absolutely everything except prohibition. And you give her a pass on that because her father was a hopeless alcoholic and died from alcohol-induced um, mental illness and insanity and you know, delirium and, and things like that. So you could understand why she might be for banning alcohol, but everything else, you, you know, if, if Eleanor says, go right, go right. You know, if she says, take that fork, take that fork, because she's been right about everything. She was a moral force and remains so. I think that's well put. Um, I'm wondering, though, speaking of moral forces, when you see the reckoning that Germany has done with the Holocaust, um, a lot of people would say, well, that's because they sort of started things or they, it all began with Hitler or whatever. What do we need to do? I mean, you worked in partnership with the Holocaust Museum. I remember when the Holocaust Museum was first being built, people were saying, that was all over in Europe. Why do we need a Holocaust Museum here in DC? But we do need a Holocaust Museum. I mean, your film it. bears that out. Yeah, what I, else do we need? What else do you think? Do we need a reckoning well, I, like I, Germany I where you see could... signposts everywhere in Berlin and throughout I, the country? You know, what's so impressive about I think Germany really has has handled it. It's not to say that it, there aren't anti-Semitic forces still present there, perhaps growing, perhaps threatening them, um, but they've really figured out how to have a deep and and um, impressive reckoning with it in a way that our exceptionalism and our sense of uh, isolation, you know, these two oceans really protect us from a lot of stuff. It's 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 you know I don't mean to take a, a parody of 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 German prison life in Stalag uh, thirteen, but you know, Colonel or Sergeant Schultz says I know nothing, I know nothing, and and Americans have sort of done that through through kind of half open uh, fingers. The Germans have said we have to own it. And so you, can, you can't walk anywhere in Berlin without looking down and seeing, you know, a, a, something embedded in the ground about a human life lost and the memorials to it. And I, I think there's that the way they teach it, and we're now even debating whether we should teach it, 
uh, you know, or if we do, you know, can we sanitize it? Uh, I heard something while we were finishing up editing that helped, you know, give me a kick in the pants. It's some teacher said, I'd like to teach the Holocaust from the German point of view, you know, and, and, and that's what we found, as you suggested earlier, Michael, that we were going to do the U.S. and the Holocaust, and it is that. But we realized in doing that, we had to retell the Holocaust in a new way, not not for the sake of newness, but just so that we could sort of inhale and exhale with the American story we were trying to tell. And we ended up retelling it and rediscovering it and re, I think, configuring it in a way that is um, as shocking. And yet you can't turn away from this story. You, you, you just you also can't, can't, excuse me, turn away from a reckoning with Vietnam or a reckoning with indigenous people and the way they right. were treated. I mean, there's a, maybe a necessary triage in this or is that a foolish well, you know, we've done it with Vietnam. We've done it. Uh, we're doing it, have done it and are doing it now with a film I'm making on the American Buffalo. You'd think that'd be nothing like the U.S. and the Holocaust, but Madison Grant and the passing of the great race and the eugenicists make a terrifying appearance in that. And of course, we're talking about, um, you know, the elimination of a species of animal. But we knew as we were eliminating that animal that we'd also be eliminating the people who for 600 generations had depended on that animal uh, for everything from the tail to the snort, literally, uh, as the buffalo sounds w worked into sacred dances, um, that, that no buffalo, no Indian. And so there's a kind of painful reckoning in that. So, you know, I, I've been accused of sanitizing stuff at times, and I shake my head and go, I don't know where you get that. And I know, you know, I'm waiting for the accusations of sort of this dark vision of, of America, which I also don't have. I you know, I just want to, it's just, the, as you said earlier, it's just balls and strikes. Well, we're going to go to questions. Uh, and before we do, I want to um, say a few more things about Our America, Ken's new book, which uh, I'm unhesitatingly promoting here because it's a wonderful picture, travel, really, uh, and adventure through American history. In fact, uh, Ken's first film, I guess many of you probably know, was about the Brooklyn Bridge. Always made me mindful of that great poem of Hart Crane's. There's a picture in the collection, Our America, from the Brooklyn Bridge, one century before that film was made, 1881. The film was made in 1981. And there are extraordinary pictures of virtually every state. I think it covers every state. Every, also state, has, every state in our union and probably every film subject that we've done. I was just looking also at the picture. There's a picture of uh, some, some amazing photographs of Walt Whitman and John Brown and Abraham Lincoln and J.P. Morgan. You just go through the list. Edna St. Vincent Millay, almost any, all the way up to Hemingway and even uh, <clears throat> John Lewis. Um, a whole pastiche, really, of pictures which also bring to mind and, and come back to Ken's vision, perhaps in the U.S. and the Holocaust, bring to my mind at least uh, someone to whom this book, Our America, is dedicated, Ken's mentor, calls him his father, his other father, besides Robert Burns, not the poet, Robert Burns' father uh, of Ken Burns, Robert Burns Jr. But Jerry Liebling, Jerome Liebling, was like a father to Ken Burns in so many ways, a mentor. This book is a tribute to him. And if you're not familiar with his photographs, I strongly urge you to make yourself familiar with them. He was not only a mentor to Ken, but he is someone who needs to be given greater recognition in the hierarchy and in the pantheon of American, great American photographers. And he was Jewish and he served in World War II. And then he, after World War II, became very much opposed to war. So as I said to Ken, he could do it from the seat of authority since he had been through the war and seen it firsthand. But he said, you figure out how to show pain and people will see that pain. And you've done this miraculously in the U.S. and the Holocaust. And it comes across so well in our America. I was asked to pick some photographs from our America, and I wanted people to just see some of these photographs before we go into the question and answers. Um, this is a Russian Jewish immigrant, because so much of this has to do with the words by that Jewish immigrant uh, on the Statue of Liberty. Um, and here it is, a Russian Jewish immigrant at Ellis Island, New York, 1905, uh, a picture that, well, speaks volumes, obviously. It's, um, it's one of the most beautiful photo photographs ever. It's taken by Lewis Hine, uh, the great, great photographer. I, I've lived with this photograph most of my life. Jerry introduced it to me. It's, it, it's, it's, it's spectacular. 
just so much that comes across in the facial countenance and the expression alone is spectacular. So the um, idea of this book, Michael, was to show just one photograph per page with minimum caption. I think this says Ellis Island 1905, and that's it. Um, and then in the back matter, you can find a thumbnail of the photograph and a much more expansive prose description and provenance of it. But the idea was to not be a director and you can only look at this for two seconds or eight seconds, uh, or I'm gonna zoom on this, or I'm gonna pull out from that, or I'm gonna show only a detail of that, but to allow each person to invest the trust in their own sensory apparatus to see and receive the photograph and do it in concert with the one next to it on the page and then proceed through all of American history and then look at it, have to look at it again to understand the backstory of, of, of some of these photographs. And, and in addition to all the celebrated people that you mentioned, um, there's also this gal and there are kids playing and there's joy and there's the landscape and there's the elements of dispossession and of native people and their sort of presence in the face of that, you know, horrible uh, extermination and, and some would say genocide of them. So that it's, it's, you know, the, sometimes the photographers are famous in this case, Louis Hine, one of our greatest photographers, some of them, the photographers are unknown. Um, so amazing photographs, and so many of them tie in with your work, with baseball, with jazz, with the uh, Second World War, with films that you made. Here's another one I wanted people to see, a Jewish immigrant, New York City, 1919, looking a little bit like Rodin's uh, famous statue with hand on uh, the chin. Uh, the but this, <laughs> this what, what caught me about this, you mentioned the descriptions that you used, was the reference, and you made a reference earlier to General Grant, you former President of the United States, Ulysses S. Grant, who was an anti-Semite and who tried to keep immigrants out of Kentucky, Tennessee, and Mississippi. Right. And this was specifically aligned with this photograph in terms yeah, of the so, description. So we use that as a description. Abraham Lincoln, thank God, overruled him. He was then a general in the West. He hadn't even been moved east and promoted to the major general who will be responsible with his friend, William Tecumseh Sherman, for the Union uh, victory, um, me meaning they're willing to sacrifice Union soldiers and still keep marching on. But this is taken right when the country has decided that we don't want any more of his kind in. We're okay back with the young Russian immigrant girl, kind of. Um, you know, there's a million immigrants coming in every year from 1905 to, to 1914. There are 2.5 million um, Jews came into New York uh, in the course of that great rush between the 1870s. Um, but, but right now, uh, this is becoming less hospitable place. And very shortly we'll have, as I've been talking ad nauseum about the Johnson Reed Immigration Act, which makes quotas from the country that he is from. Uh, they don't specifically, it's not a specifically anti-Jewish. It's just no accident that the countries that have large Jewish or Catholic populations have much smaller quotas than those who are white, white Protestants. In fact, Jews and eugenics are classified as uncouth Asiatics. So we're gonna we're gonna go to the questions now. Uh, I want to mention one other photograph though that we couldn't get permission to show. Well, that's a photograph worth looking at. That's Roosevelt on the Florida coast in 1935. But the one I wanted to show, and I wanted to talk with Ken briefly about this before we go to the questions, was a, a famous photograph of different water fountains uh, taken in North Carolina in 1950 for colored quote unquote and for whites. Uh, and the reason. I wanted to bring that in was, well, because you point out in the film, the Nazis learned a lot from our Jim Crow system. I mean, Isabel Wilkerson has written about this in her book, Cast, and Cast, yeah. uh, I had the privilege of interviewing her in depth about this, but there's so much that we don't know that we're not taught in our history books about yeah, well, that confluence between Nazis and Jim Crow. So the so as I said, you know, Hitler admired our extermination of the of the native peoples, and he wanted to do the same. He thought that you know the remainder had been clustered into reservations, what he would call concentration camps. He liked the Johnson Reed Immigration Act. Um, he, you know, we we just you know go on and on about that. But when German jurists came to the United States to study our Jim Crow law and actually made anti-discrimination laws in 1935, Nuremberg laws that were less pernicious than 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 some of the state Jim Crow laws. Uh, you know, when we protested, they would just look at us and go, Mississippi, what are you talking about? 
You consider these people inferior. We consider these people inferior. Who are you to talk to us about that? Suzanne, we have some questions for Ken. Yep, here I come. <clears throat> Thank you both for that fabulous conversation. Um, a few people wanted to know, Ken, um, what's the biggest surprise you ha you ran across when making this series and what has the impact been on you personally? Well, it, you know, let me take the impact uh, part first. Uh, you know, I, as I said, as I was promoting the film and I think it got m really misunderstood, I said, I won't work on a more important film. And maybe I just didn't emphasize it. I, I hope I've worked on films that are as important, the Civil War, jazz, you know, Roosevelt's Vietnam, whatever they might be, Brooklyn Bridge. Um, I hope that the films I'm working on now and will work on in the future could be as important, but I will not work on anything more important. It's been life-changing and life transforming for me. Uh, Every day is a revelation. We don't make films about what we know about, you know, we make films about what we're curious. And so having to digest the full extent of American anti-Semitism, pre-existing condition, right? And the way it's manifesting now um, is so startling. Um, learning also about the Shoah by Bullets, which I suppose that I knew something about, but I didn't understand that well more than a million, maybe a million and a half people were killed long before anyone said, hmm, carbon monoxide, you know, might be able to do it. And then Zykon B to make it cheaper and more efficient. They got it down to one US penny per person that they were able to murder. Um, I but can't they, were more killed by bullets than in gas chambers or in no, ovens? No, or, no, no, more in gas chambers. But but I think we forget how staggering the numbers is of people just shot into pits, killed, you know, in Belarus. In, Lined in, up and in, shot uh, just, you know, co completely capriciously. Yeah, yeah, co just completely I said, rounded up and shot. We've found some footage. We're very careful about, you know, I, I'm very susceptible to things I, I, there's a, something called war porn, and I, I assume by extension there's something called Holocaust porn, where you re-victimize by showing it just gratuitously. And so we pulled out a few fuel rods, but obviously in some cases you just have to show the horrors of it. And we found some footage, they're home movies, uh, soldiers sending back proud of what they're doing, killing Jews in pits in Poland and in Ukraine and Belarus and Lithuania, um, Latvia. And it's, you know, a, a million people, million and a half people before the killing centers in Nazi-occupied Poland, of which Auschwitz, Tabrinka, Sobibor. But I meant to say, I misspoke that there were more killed. And I think I have Sarah Bostin, uh pointed, uh, pointed this out, more killed before the operation went into full genocide than, had, than were killed in the ways we have become accustomed to think of them being killed. But Andy, and, and it ended up that more people were killed in gas chambers in those killings. Yes, yes, yeah, but, right. But by the end of the war, and, and the other sad fact is that probably 75 or 80 percent of those killed in the Holocaust were killed before there was a single American soldier's boot on the continent in Europe, in Italy. And yeah. it would be even more time before there was a place where a plane could possibly fly there and our imprecise bombing wouldn't have been able to find the tracks to deter this things. And if they had bombed the tracks accidentally, they could have been replaced overnight. And so then you have a much more existential question that we've discussed before, my friend, of whether you bomb the camps themselves and kill in, in, inmates to stop the slaughter. And, and you know, as the scholar Rebecca Erbelding, Deborah Lipset thought maybe we should just to call attention. Rebecca Erbelding said, you know, are we the people who knew that they were being killed and did nothing? Or are the people we did and bombed it? You know, there's, there's a kind of a no-win situation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, uh, someone had asked, they had seen the, the, the series and wanted to know why there was not attention drawn to Sephardic Jews and, and the fate of the Sephardic Jews during the Holocaust. Well, because uh, it's, a, it's an important story, but it's a, it's a tangential one to what the Nazi Germany were doing. Where mo the, your, it, it was the destruction of the European Jews that they, that they sought. And uh, because Spain, which would have had a relatively modest population of Sephardic Jews, was neutral and other places were part of the Nazi regime, that's, it was to us not something, I mean, first of all, we're not an encyclopedia. And so we're, we, we limit the stories, even the six and a half hours comes down from, you know, 40 times that much material. 
to us, it was to talk about the European Jews that were the object of Hitler's wrath and um, his othering of this extraordinary people who had contributed so immensely, not just to German culture, but to European culture. And of course, as we know, American culture. Mm -hmm. a, a few of our Canadian uh, viewers have said they wanted just to point out that um, Canada was just as guilty and that yeah. when St. Louis docked in Halifax, the prime minister that. said none is too film. many. Yeah, yeah the, the calls went out as soon as Havana kicked them out. They took only a few, a handful, 30 or something people and the rest, over 900, were uh, you know languishing and it was steaming up and down the Atlantic coast begging to be let in. The Johnson Reed Act wouldn't have permitted it. Um, Canada refused. And on the way over, uh, Jewish organizations, particularly the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee and the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society cobbled together about $500,000 and convinced four nations, France and Britain and the Netherlands and um, uh, Belgium to take in all of those people. They were not returned to Germany. Three quarters of them escaped. Uh, unfortunately, a quarter of them uh, were were killed when the Germans overran the country, their countries of sanctuary. And it's really important to get the St. Louis story right. And it's true. Uh, you know, we let in, we, the United States of America let in uh, more, 225,000 refugees, more than, by far than any other sovereign nation. Mm -hmm. Uh, is it true that Eleanor Roosevelt later said that she regretted that her husband's administration didn't act to help the Jews during the Holocaust? I don't know if she said that, but it did act and it didn't do enough and it didn't do enough quickly and it was constrained from being able to do enough. And in the world of real politics, sometimes you have to do one thing even though you want to do another. But I can't look into Franklin Roosevelt's heart. He, Both he and Eleanor grew up where anti-Semitism was just you know, part of the conversation. But in order to progress in the rough and tumble world, as Jeff Ward says in New York politics, you got to get along with everybody. And they did. And he added more Jews to his administration than any other administration up to that point in the United States history. His secretary of treasury was his dear friend and upstate neighbor, uh, Henry Morgenthau, who himself as a young man had seen when his father was an envoy to um, the Ottoman Empire, the, the Turkish um, uh, genocide of Armenians. And so you've got a lot of complicated narratives. And if you just want to keep it binary, you, you run the risk of, of losing the subtleties and the nuances of history and how we understand it. I mean, I'll tell you a story. I think I've told this to Michael. Somebody went up to I.F. Stone, the great um, journalist and historian, and said, you know, couldn't, the uh, acolytes said, couldn't believe that he admired Thomas Jefferson. And, and Stone just shook his head and he said, because history is tragedy, not melodrama. And what I think he meant was that in melodrama, all villains are perfectly villainous and all heroes are perfectly virtuous. But life and history, this is a great tragedy. None of us get out of here alive. And so we're- I'm sorry, a good example, if I may, because I'm giving a, a talk tonight on cancel culture uh, to Lairhouse Judaica. It's not a promotion, just a fact tonight. And I'm prompted to just chime in here with the fact that Jefferson was a slave owner, therefore, should we cancel the Declaration of Independence? That kind of speaks volumes to me about what we're talking about here. But Roosevelt has been charged, and I just like your response to this very strongly with the attitude that he could have stopped, he could have done more with the St. Louis. You don't see it that way. I don't, I don't really think so. As Rebecca Erbelding and many other scholars have told us, it's been, it's been, he's been the bete noir of a lot of historians and there are a lot of revisions. And unfortunately, I think one's politics in this present moment go back. And so when you take one of the great, you know, presidents of the United States who happens to be a Democrat, it's very incumbent on people to go back and sort of who aren't Democrats and go back and find things that are wrong with him. Um, there's there's no way he could have let anyone in. The, the law required that they get in line and apply, which might have been years and years and years of, uh, of, of unbelievable uh, waiting uh, for the Johnson-Reed Act to even consider their visas. Um, 
And if he if he tried it, many people think that he could have been impeached because of the anti-immigration sentiment in the Congress, even among members of his own party. Remember, by the mid by by that time, by the late 1930s, um, he's he, he's lost a lot in other areas. Uh, he's got the solid South, but they're immensely conservative, immensely anti-immigrant, and immensely anti-Semitic, and they're all committee chairmen. And you know. Who's to say what would have happened? But the hue and cry, and he's working on the neutrality acts, as the scholar Peter Hayes said. If they're not revoked, we might have a different history. Thank you. As we begin to wrap up, uh, can you talk a little bit about the role of the media um, when covering anti-Semitism, both the Jewish media as well as the mainstream media, um, both then and now? Yeah, well, it, as now, it's a whole mix of things. There are people who have biases, that, you know, we would say conservative biases or to the right who are anti-Jewish. The Jewish press is itself torn in pieces. Like, do you speak out a lot and risk Jews in Germany? And the Germans are telling that to the, uh, Jews outside of Germany. Keep, keep talking and you'll make it worse for them. Or do you speak out? You know, what do you want your government to do? If you're in the mainstream media, how do you take this? Is this a war rumor? Do you put it on the front page or do you put it on page six? If you put it on page six, you're telling people you don't really think it's a big deal. It takes a long time for this stuff about the, the actual killings and the death centers and the killing centers and, and the concentration camps to reach the front page. And when they do, there's incredible outrage, but it doesn't really move the needle on American polling about letting in more people. And even after the concentration camps are liberated, when the war's over, when we're the heroes of it, no 5% of Americans want to let in more refugees than the Johnson-Reed Act will permit. Thank you. Um, we're going to wrap up with one last question. I'm sorry we couldn't get to more, um, but you mentioned earlier, uh, you know, you must have hours and hours of film and interviews and things that you couldn't include. Um, is there one thing that you just you had to put on the cutting room floor that you wish you included? And what about all of that other footage? Is there a place that that's going to be housed at some point that people can access that? So I don't own that footage. We license only what we use. There's hundreds of things that we didn't use. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you one thing. One thing that would have driven home the point of, the, of the Anne Frank uh, and their efforts to get to the United States, which people think, oh, Anne Frank's a story over there. And we put it at the prologue of our film and it's sort of near the end of our film. We had a scene where they had American pen pals in Burlington, Iowa, and we had an exchange of letters. It was a beautiful scene. It was just, if you've seen the movie, I'm a bit of too many notes. So the, 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 I, I would liken the work that we do to um, bringing a block of, of stone to a sculptor's studio and you chisel away. What's on the floor may be more than what's in the remaining statue. And the sculptress has to um, honor the negative space of creation, that which is not used. But that rubble doesn't make a second piece of sculpture, right? As much as you think that that would, um, it, it doesn't get unless it's remelted down and reformed. Uh, and, and that's our process. And it, it's just part of the horrible, you know, Michael used the word triage before. A lot of that storytelling is editing human experience, right? How was your day, honey? Does not begin with I back slowly down the driveway, avoiding the garbage can at the curb. We just cut, unless of course somebody T-bones you and that happens and that's exactly the way you tell it. But mostly you say, I can't believe what an SOB my boss is, right? And then you tell a story. And so it requires the necessary contraction of, of, of human experience. So we gather as much as we can. We use as much as we can. We go as deep as we can in the storytelling. But at the end of the day, it is a story and not a dictionary or an encyclopedia uh, with unlimited stuff. You're, you're well working within the purview and the laws of Aristotelian poetics. And they really determine, you know, uh, they tell you a lot uh, about how, how, how your story will unfold. I know we've got to wrap up. So what extraordinary storytelling you and your team have done. Uh, once again, congratulations. 
Thank you, Michael. Always good to be in conversation with you. And thank you to Suzanne and to Moment Magazine. Yeah, thank you, Suzanne, so much. Yes, and thank you very much, Ken. Thank you, Michael. We really appreciate you bringing uh, this story to our Moment audience. Uh, I want to let everybody know that I've put a link to the series, which you can still access on PBS, uh, as well as a link to the book, uh, Amer um, Our America of Photographic History, which you can now purchase. I will send an email later this week that will include links to both this recording as well as links to the book and the documentary. Uh, please go to momentmag.com where you can register for next week's program with NPR journalist Nina Totenberg about her friendship and relationship with Ruth, uh, Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Again, thank you both for joining us and we'll see everybody next time. Thank you. Thank you.